thanks so much for, for hosting me here. Um, today, I want to talk a bit more about search, especially multilingual search. So I'm originally from German. And in Europe, uh, the borders are really close. And as soon as you cross the borders, often people speak like other languages. You go to the Netherlands, they speak Dutch, you go to France, they speak French. And so it's it's quite natural to, to be exposed to, to many different languages. But the question is like, how do you search in, in many different languages? And sadly, in many cases, when it's not Google, search performs really poorly. And as soon as you add more languages to the mix, the, the quality even drops further. And today I wanna to talk a bit more about new developments using AI, how to make search, especially in a multilingual setting, a lot better, which can then also be used for uh, classification. So I will talk about more about like connection of search and classification and how to really do like multilingual classification and cross-lingual classification. A bit more about myself. So I started uh, my PhD in 2014, doing NLP for like 10 years now, looking into like really deep learning from, from the early on and have been doing a lot of these embeddings. So, so maybe people recognize it like semantic search embeddings and they become every year like more and more popular on which I've been working for quite a long time. So in 2018, I created the sentence purge and sentence transformer paper, then working a lot on like benchmarks. How can you really evaluate these models? How can you really ensure that you have like a good model that performs extremely well? I've been working up to last year at Hugging Face and then joined last year Cohere as Director of Machine Learning where I'm supervising um, all our efforts in terms of text understanding. So Cohere, what we do is we train foundational models and provide them as a service. We have two, two big areas in terms of text understanding. The one is generate. You give the model a prompt. Um, write me an article about what you can do in winter in New York City as a family. And then it spits out you the, the relevant article. And the other areas like text understanding, where prime use cases like search, you have a query, you want to find the relevant information. And text classification, you have, for example, tweets, and you want to know, OK, what's the sentiment of the tweet? Are people happy or unhappy about a certain product? And the, really the magic, what we're currently working on is combining these two to combine text understanding and generate. So if you asked uh, generative models, what do our employees think about our benefits? It spits out some results, but sadly it's not really mirroring what your employees think about the benefits. Similar when you ask uh, like generative model, hey, what has been discussed with client? So far, gives you some text, but it's nothing what you have discussed with the client. And here you really need text understanding with generate. So when you ask like, hey, what have we discussed with client X so far? It should look, um, it should search over your knowledge base. So it can be your email, Slack, Salesforce, HubSpot, I don't know, some Word documents you have. You wanna analyze these results and then you want to take these analysis and generate. For example, hey, you have discussed so far ABC in the next meeting, you promise to follow up on these points and then you can know, okay, this is what we discussed so far and really make sure that I follow up on these points. <clears throat> so this requires an extremely good search results. Obviously, when you ask what has been discussed with client X so far, if the search fails and doesn't find the relevant information, it's impossible to generate any good output on that. And so here I want to talk a bit more like how can you do like the search and how can you analyze the text better. So search typically consists of multiple stages. First, you have the index server. This can be like a traditional index server like Elasticsearch, or it can be one of the newer um, players in the field like Pinecone, Vivian, Qdrend, which are specialized on semantic search using embeddings. Mm -hmm. Then you have the first stage approach uh, these are like the what, what people know as an embedding approach where you go from potentially 100 million documents to 1,000 documents. And then you forward this to a second stage approach, uh, which is a lot more powerful where you use like a larger model. But here it's not really feasible to apply this model to like all 100 million documents. So you just do it on like the top 1,000 you get from the first. And then you have the final results. And for a really long time, Final results means like top 10 list as you know it from Google, 
but now uh, more and more interest comes from like a con conversational interface. So you take a generate model and you ask the model questions about the results. It should paraphrase results. Maybe it should rewrite some code, like I don't know, in, in your SDK, in your documentation, you have an example for, for Python, but the user prefers an example in PHP. And so you ask the model to, to rewrite the program for you. And obviously you want to have some feedback. So how you want to have like continuously improving uh, stack. And this is what I'm and my team is focusing on at Cohere. How can we build like these systems and how can we improve, continuously improve them based on the feedback your users are giving on the, uh, on the results that are shown from the search results. Safi searches in a really bad shape. So, so if you exclude the large uh, web searches like Google Bing, and, and you go to even popular websites like Wikipedia, I mean, it's massive. It's one of the most popular websites in the world. And you use the search bar, what is the capital of the United States? A really simple search query. Top results, Wikipedia is showing you about capital punishment in the United States. And sadly, also the other results it's showing, it's not really relevant. So the article about Washington DC, it's not on the first page, it's somewhere on like page two, three, four. So it's so really down the line. So that's also, no one is really using these search bars. So on Wikipedia, everyone goes to Google. And if you want to find like some results, like you Google, uh, you search it on Google and then you go to Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. On public information, that's possible, but on private information, for example, information um, in your email inbox, uh, documents you have in your Dropbox, that's that's not possible. Or also in inside of companies, it's not indexed in Google. And sadly, because the search function is so bad, a lot of information is lost um, inside, yeah, inside your company because you're not able to find it. <clears throat> search becomes even worse when you have to do it in um, in a multilingual setting. So for, for many years, like decades, people have been using lexical search. So you take the query, what's the capital of the United States, you split it into words, and then you find articles that can contain the word capital, United States, and then this article contains a lot of the words like capital, the, and United States, and is. And that's why it's ranked really high. On English, you can tokenize on the white spaces. So you, you find like all the white spaces in the text and you do something which is called stemming where you remove like the word ending and then you filter out like certain stop words which are not that relevant. <clears throat> this works for English, but if you go to a language like Chinese or Japanese, they're like no white spaces. So, so tokenization on white spaces doesn't work. Stemming also has to be a different approach. And also stop words in Chinese are obviously different than stop words in English. So what you do is like for every language you wanna support, you build up like such a system. So you build up a system for English, you build up a system for Spanish, you build up a system for Chinese, and then you, you optimize these individual systems. And in the case of Wikipedia, which is available in, I don't know, 200 languages. This means you have like 200 in these, like 200 pipelines. You have 200 different database search index instances, which you need to monitor, which you need to scale. And also if you want to make an improvement, you have to do the improvement on 200 languages. And sadly, it's not really transferable. So, so in English, if you want to support British English and American English, so you don't know, for the word color, how does the user spell it with O-R or O-U-R, O-U-R at the end. Uh, you have to implement it then specifically for English, but this sadly doesn't work for Spanish. So any sp spelling variation in Spanish, you have to implement it and so on and so on. So it's one of the most painful experiences you can have in terms of search. <laughs> However, what we've been focusing on in the, in the past, um, past half year is to do like semantic search uh, across languages. So first semantic search, not only gives you like a much better results, but it's also a lot easier to deploy and also works amazingly well across languages. 
So here I prepared like a short demo and then afterwards in the presentation, I will talk more about like how you can you train these models and yeah, what, what's really needed to get like an excellent performance. Um, so here's an example about like on, on Wikipedia where we index different languages, some Latin-based languages, some non-Latin-based like Arabic, Japanese, Korean, and Chinese. And here's like the lexical search. So, so that's what you most commonly find like in any website, in any application, people use lexical search. If you search for how is the weather in Toronto, lexical search thinks the word weather is really important. So it gives you many results on, on weather. So top one is like studying how the weather works on other planets has been helpful for understanding how the weather works on Earth. In contrast, semantic search, which I will also show, will be able to search across all the Wikipedias and find the most relevant information. So he had found a um, document from the Spanish Wikipedia. If we Google translate it, we see that the, the Wikipedia contains information about Toronto winters occasionally feature short snaps when maximum temperature remains below minus 10. Um, it also gives me results from the English Wikipedia, German Wikipedia, and also down here <clears throat> from the Korean Wikipedia, which does not have like even like a Latin alphabet, but still it contains relevant information how the weather is in Toronto. Similar when I do like capital France. Again, if I use like out of the box lexical search, what's applied on Wikipedia, top article is about France 24 in Vichy France and Ile de France and Philippine American War. So pretty much all the results are completely useless you get from lexical search. Semantic search in contrast, if we just say, okay, give us English results, we get on the first, like Paris is the capital uh, and most populous cities of France. So it gives us the most relevant results at the, at the start. And we even can like, as mentioned, search across languages. So if I search in Japanese and I look at the first results, I find like the information that the capital is Paris. So on the one side, the, the performance is much better. So the search quality is much higher, but also a lot nicer to deploy. And also the cross-lingual setting will open up many interesting use cases to build. So, so in many settings, you don't know in which language is the relevant information. So if you think about like an uh, international company, a multinational company, you have teams in different languages, and then the Spanish team is, is writing documentation and is chatting and sharing information in Spanish, and the French, French team is doing this in French, and the German team is doing this in German. And then you come in and think about, hey, does our company have some knowledge about topic X? And here you would need to know uh, which, which country is doing topic X. Is it like Spanish and you need to search in Spanish? Why is it French and you need to search in French? And yeah, obviously you don't know this. And so, so a lot of information in these multinational settings is really lost. So, so if you don't know what's the language you're looking for, it's really hard to find it with lexical search, but with semantic search, it works really nicely. So how does semantic search work? Let's dive into a bit more into like NLP. So the fundamental concept is vector spaces. So what you do is you take all the documents, for example, all the articles you have on Wikipedia, and you use machine, a machine learning model to project them into a vector space. And then when a query comes in, for example, what's the weather in Toronto? It projects also this query in the vector space and then it looks in the vector space which documents are close. And what you train the model for is so that these are the closed documents. So, so you ask, like, what's the capital of France? And then this document tells you that Paris is the capital of France, and you can show it to the user. So, so everything is based on these vector spaces. And in principle, to get these vector spaces, if you have a model, is uh, straightforward. So you take a transformer network like BERT, 
uh, you put the documents into the BERT network, the BERT gives you contextualized word embeddings as the output. You do a pooling operation so that you get like from 10, 100,000 tokens to like one single vector. And you do the same with the query. You take the query what's the capital of France, uh, put it into the BERT network, put it through pooling, you get like one fixed size vector of, for example, uh, 768 dimensions. And then you can compare these two vectors, for example, using cosine similarity or some other similarity distance measure. And this gives you at the end the score, how relevant is the query to the document. The nice thing about this is that vector spaces don't care about languages. So it doesn't matter if my input is like English to docs in the snow, or if it has been German, by Hundem Schnee, or if it has been Spanish or Chinese, it's just points in the vector space. So what's connected to it, which language it is, or even which modality it is, it can be an image, can be video, it can be audio. It doesn't matter. And you can train these models to completely ignore the language and project it to these vector spaces. And this makes it possible to search across languages and also to use the same system for many, many different languages. It also works for classification. Um, so if we think about, um, we wanna classify examples if they talk about dogs or cats. So what we do is like, we, we take our training examples, we project them to the vector space, say here we have an example about dogs, here we have examples about cats, and then we do the same decision boundary. So we learn, okay, where do we have to separate off examples in, in, uh, in, 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 in uh, sorry, on dogs or on cats. And then everything above is talking about cats. Everything below is talking about dogs. And you don't care about the language. So you can have training examples in a single language and then still be able to classify across languages. So here we also have like an example where we have like different uh, training examples. So, so we define different categories on sport, business, politics, and tech. And we say, okay, here are like three examples per category. And now we want to classify um, like a new example. And then it will spit out eventually um, that this is or it should spit out that this is uh, from politics, even such that it has never seen like Arabic in the example. Finally, the, the last benefit is simplicity. So before you had like these 100, 200 different systems, which you need to monitor, develop, maintain, and so on. Now everything is the same. So you have document queries that can be in 100 languages. Um, this document query goes to some embedding model that projects it to the vector space, you put it into like a vector database, and then you are able to search on it. And it doesn't care if your use case is like English or French or Chinese or Hindi, it doesn't care if it stays in the same language, so you search from Arabic to Arabic, or if you mix the languages and you search in Chinese on documents from Korean, Russian, and, and, and German, um, doesn't matter. So it's extreme simplification and within five minutes, you get like really good search results that work across 100 languages. <laughs> now to go a bit more on the technical side, how are these embedding models trained? So the most popular approach is uh, so-called multiple negative ranking loss. And here you have positive pairs. So you, you need positive pairs um, as training examples. And what you use as positive pairs is like really flexible. And that's how you can steer how the vector space looks like and what the, the vector space or how you find relevant information. One possibility is you take query and answer passages. Other options, for example, you take questions and duplicate questions so that you can find similar questions in, in the vector space. Or you have a paper title and you want to find the paper abstract or in an e-commerce setting, you have query and the product, the person purchased based on the query. And then what you want is that AI and PI, so A1 and P1 should be close in the vector space. So you project in a batch like everything in the vector space, you say, okay, this, this is my anchor, 
this is my positive, A1 and P1 should be closed in my vector space and all the other text you have in the vector space should be distant. So you pull A1 and P1 close and you push A1 and P2 to all the other P's like distant in the vector space. And it's really similar to like a multiple choice um, test from school. So you have a question, for example, how many people live in Berlin? You have different possible answers on this P1, P2, and P3. And you ask the model, uh, which of these is the correct answer? So what you do is you compute the embedding for the A, you compute the embeddings for the B, P, and then you compute the similarities and say, okay, similarity of A1 and P1 is 0 0.5, 0 0.3, and 0 0.1. And then you say, okay, this is my prediction. I predicted similarity of A1 and P1 is 0.5, A1 and P2 is 0.3, and A1 and P3 is 0.3. And from the construction of the training data, you know A1 and P1 should be correct. So you say, okay, this is the, the um, correct answer. And then you just train it with cross entropy loss. And yeah, you, you update the model. How can you improve the, um, the quality of the model? So one easy trick to improve the quality of the model is to use a larger batch size. So what we see here on the X axis is the size of the batch. <clears throat> and on the Y axis, the quality on a benchmark. And what we see is like the larger the batch size, the the better the quality. And it's comparable to like a multiple choice test. In school, if you have like two answer options, it's like easy to randomly guess the correct one. If you have 10 answer options, 100 answer options, a thousand answer op options, it's much harder to, to guess the correct answer based on this. <laughs> the other option is to add hard negatives. So these are you don't choose like the other answer options like randomly, but you provide, try to provide like answers which are still wrong or really look similar to the question and which are plausible. And this gives you also like a next nice boost in terms of model quality. So here you would train, you go from like pairs to like triplets. You say you have an anchor, you have a positive and you have a negative. And then again, you project everything in the batch um, in the vector space and you say, okay, A1 and P1 should be close in the vector space and all the exa other examples, including N1 should be distant in the vector space. And a good example for such a negative would be the following. So how many people live in London? You say the positive is like 9 million people live in London and the hard negative would be 1 million people live in Birmingham, second to London because this answer is kind of like similar to the P on like a syn syntax level, but it's not a valid answer to, to the question. <clears throat> However, what happens quickly is so-called false negatives or also like bad examples. So if you have like a triplet, like how many people live in London and then around 9 million people live in London and London has a population of 9 million people, this extremely confuses the model because it tries to, to optimize that A and P is close in the vector space, but A and M is distant in the vector space. But however, you as a human would say, yeah, both, both are valid answers to the question. So both should be close to the vector, uh, to, to the question, um, the, the vector of the question. So it's extremely critical to have like really high data quality and to have like really good clean triplets um, that always fulfill this property that a and P is like a valid pair and A and N is an invalid pair. If you have like 10 pairs, 100 pairs, that's easy to construct. But if you have like a billion of C such triplets, uh, you find need to find like automated ways <clears throat> to ensure that. So how do you train cross multilingual and cross-lingual um, models? In 2020, I presented like an approach so-called multilingual knowledge distillation, where you say, okay, I have this um, English model, which works for like search in English. And then I take parallel data from machine translation. So, so there are like a lot of data sets available where you have the text in English and then the same text in German or Chinese and Arabic. 
and you take the te English text, you pass it through your teacher model, your English teacher model projected to a vector space. And then you take the parallel text, like the English and German here, pass it through like the student model to learn, to give you like some embedding for English and some embedding for German. And then you just say, okay, these two vectors, like this teacher English vector and the student English vector should be close in the vector space. Mm -hmm. And the English teacher vector and this German student vector should also be close in the vector space. So you, you teach a student on the one side to mimic the teacher, to produce for English the same vector space um, as the teacher, but and at the same time um, to align all other languages to English. The other option is like uh, you use this constructor lane training, what, what I presented before. Um, so, and, and here the issue is a bit if you use like one of the, or this previous approach where you align like other languages to English, is that the model learns to, to represent English topics quite well. So for example, a lot of English training data is on the US tax system. How do you file your taxes in the US? Which tax forms exist? What do you put into all of these forms? What do like specific things mean? And then if you align other languages to it, so, so you take Korean, you take German, you take Arabic, and you align it to this English vector space, the model learns like Korean, Arabic, German, how to do your taxes in the US, but it doesn't know anything about like language and country specific topics. So, <clears throat> so what is relevant for people in Arabic? What do they search for? What information do they want to have? And here conservative training is the better approach, but there's a question like, how do you get question and answer pairs in these hundreds of languages? And so that's what we did at Kuhir. Um, in, in the past year, we caught a large set of question answer pairs from the web. We looked at irrelevant pairs. So for example, you have a question, but then there's like a, these nefty cookie consent burners, or please sign up, or please pay here. <clears throat> um, it's kind of easy to filter out this in English, but if you have to do it across 100 languages, it's kind of a challenge. So how do you detect what classifies as a question in Chinese and is there maybe like some cookies sign up whatever page uh, in Chinese uh, so this is kind of challenging to, to really filter out and clean up then we had to extend it to triplets where you have like question answer negative and then um, we clean them really carefully so most times we're spending like really cleaning so they were like false positive. We have a question, but the answer is not really good. Or we have a question and an answer, but the negative is not really a negative, but also like an alternative option that would be relevant for the question. And so we ended up with nearly like 900 million English triplets, five, nearly 500 million non-English triplets in several hundred or hundred, more than 100 languages. And as mentioned, it doesn't work to, to look at these billions <laughs> Of triplets by hand that you find like need to find like automated ways to clean it up and there you use many heuristics more powerful models uh, to really ensure high data quality interesting aspect when you talk about um, embedding models across languages is language bias so language bias means a preference of certain language combinations so for example one model language agnostic for its sentence embeddings from Google, um, if you project English text and Russian text to, to like a two-dimensional vector space, you see a clear separation, like all the Russian text is on the left, all the English text is on the right. Contrast other models, for example, from sentence transformers using this multilingual knowledge distillation. Here you see, okay, no, no language bias. And language bias means that there's a preference for certain language combinations. For example, in this LIDs e model, um, an English text likely retrieves another English text just because it's English, not because it's like a better result. And here the big question in terms of search engine, should you have a language bias or not? So from the term itself, you could maybe say, okay, bi bias, that's negative. You don't want to have it, but it's sadly not that easy. 
<clears throat> so side effects with the language bias is that same language results are ranked higher just because of the language, but there might be better hits or other uh, answers in other languages. And obviously, in many cases, you say, okay, I want the best answer, um, especially if I'm able to speak the language. <clears throat> However, there are also good arguments for language bias. On the one side is user preference. If I formulate a German query, um, I want to, to probably like get to see like a German answer for it and not, for example, like a Chinese answer because I'm sadly not able to speak Chinese or Japanese or Arabic. And also um, you have a higher confidence by the model. So, so it's easier to compare the query and the document pair in the same language for relevance than it is in like different languages. It's the same for human. If you see like a query in German, it's easier to compare if the German passage is relevant than compare it to another language, um, even if you are able to speak that other language quite well. <clears throat> Also, there are side effects if you train these models without language bias. So for example, imagine you do like search on images and you search for the word wedding. You might retrieve like a picture like this, the, the, the woman in a white dress and the man in a smoking white skin, like the typical wedding, how it's celebrated in like North America and, and large parts of Europe. However, if you search for wedding in Hindi, and if the model does not know anything about language, it doesn't know that this is uh, Hindi and this is English. So it just knows, okay, it's, it's like the representation of wedding. So what this query will retrieve is like the same picture. But probably someone searching in Hindi for wedding might prefer to retrieve some other picture, like more pictures how weddings are celebrated in India or like where, where Hindi is most dominantly spoken. But if the model doesn't know anything about languages, it's not able to differentiate between these two queries. Similar, when I asked for who's the president, um, say, yeah, Joe Biden, that's the current president. The issue is like, if you formulate this in French, who's the president, you're probably not so much interested in the US president. It's more likely if you formulate this in French that you are more interested in the French president. Again, when you don't have a language bias, it will just stick what's like most dominantly presented in the training data, which is primarily English, primarily from uh, the United States. So it will map everything to like a US centric view and say, okay, Joe Biden, that's the president. And there are like no other presidents on the world and there are like no other options available. To give a glimpse on like first and second stage retrieval. Um, so first stage retrieval, this, this is like what people talk about when they talk about like lexical search or about like these embedding approaches. Um, here you design like a really cheap system so that you can go quickly from 100 million documents to 100 documents or 1,000 documents. And here for, for many years, people have been using lexical search. More recently, since one, two, three years, people are more interested to use like semantic search with embeddings for this. And then in many settings, you wanna add like a second stage retrieval, which is a more expensive setting. Um, so, so here you deploy like more expensive models, but which also give you like a better search quality. Also you can take in other ranking signals, for example, you want to search for podcasts and you want to take in popularity and recency of the podcast into the results. This is not directly applicable with like lexical search or embedding search. So in the vector space, I said you can't <clears throat> encode well, what's the popularity of a podcast? What's the recency of a podcast? So here I need like the second approach that takes the 100,000, 10,000 documents from the first stage and does like a re-ranking on this. And also it's much easier to update this model. So for example, um, if Google would train like a new embedding model, they would need to apply this embedding model to the whole internet, encode the whole internet with it, put it into like a vector database and then do like an A-B test. So they have like two copies of the whole internet with encoded with different models and, and need to test which one is better. And, and with the re-ranker, it's much easier because you're just 
re-rank these hundred results you get from the first stage, it's much easier to do like an A-B test, to do like an update and to do like a stage rollout. So a lot of focus really is on, us on the second stage. <clears throat> to give you a glimpse on conversational interfaces and the future of search, um, so, so what we're currently developing and where we have like a really nice prototype available is you go from the prompt and say, okay, um, what have I discussed with my clients so far? And here you first generate like a query, which can query like different APIs, can query like emails or like your CRM system, then it gets the results from your CRM system, puts it through this re-ranking stage and takes this as an M input to the text generation model, and then it generates you the output and says, okay, these are the points you discussed with the client so far. This is what you promised to do until the next follow-up meeting, which happens next week, Tuesday. So to conclude um, um, the, the talk about lexical search and semantic search, um, lexical search still has some, some advantages. First, so it's like really cheap. Um, it's good on long documents. It's good if you have like multiple fields. And also it's good if you want to do like keyword search, you want to find that document that contain this one specific word and also works well for like unknown words. But out of the box, you have like these really low search quality. What I showed like when you search like Capital France and then it shows you like some irrelevant results. And to really boost the search quality, a lot of feature engineering is needed. So people build like a crazy amount of systems to, to improve it, to deal with like spelling mistakes, spelling variations, to do augmentation on the query side, to augmentation on the document side. And sadly, all of this is like really language dependent. So people do it for English, but then they skip all other languages. And here's semantic search with like embeddings is a much nicer approach. As shown, it it's works easily for 100 languages, the, the setup is much easier. You can nicely search across languages, which opens up super cool applications, which we have not seen before with lexical search. Um, you can find synonyms or related terms, it's language independent, but it's more expensive to operate. So vector database and, and semantic search is way more expensive than lexical search. Still has challenges with long documents and multi fields. So, how to encode this correctly? Um, if you want to do like keyword search and say, okay, find this document that contains these specific tokens, these specific words, sadly not that well optimized for that. And also a lot harder to interpret. So, so lexical search, you know, I get the documents that contain these words. So, it's easy to understand what's shown to me. But semantic search, sometimes you get bizarre errors and you don't know uh, why you get the results. And the answer is, yeah, because of the vector space, um, these two points, this query and this document is close. Uh, and, and why is it close? It's yeah, because of these 1 billion triplets we use to train the embedding model. But it's like really hard to explain why this document was found or not found, which is frustrating for, can be frustrating for users if it doesn't work and you can't explain why. That's so much from my side. Uh, thanks for listening. And yeah, if you want to use the, the model, the multilingual cross-lingual search model, um, it's really easy. You go on the Kuhir website, um, you, you sign up, get your Kuhir API IP, say, okay, these are your documents, can be in anything of the 100 documents. You have like one API call called co-embed where you provide your documents and then you combine it with some vector database and you're able to search on this. So it's like really three lines of code and then you can build like really extremely good system that's able to search in hundred languages and also across languages. Great, looking for, for your questions. Cool. So, uh, Nils, you have a bunch of questions. It looks like uh, 12 in the Q&A. People can use Q&A to enter questions, but also if you use the Zoom raise hand feature, if you wish to ask your question live, I can put you on camera or you can do audio only. It's up to you. Use the raise hand feature and uh, we'll get your question in. So, Nils, why don't you take a look at the Q&A? I don't need to read them for you. 
Yes, so there's like one question. Do you depend on the batch for negative samples? If yes, isn't it limiting? If no, how do you balance the ratio of positive and negative samples? And how do you create negative samples? Um, so here you depend. So this is what people call like in-batch negative sampling. You, you have your batch, for example, up to like five examples. So you have like five pairs in this examples. And then you say, okay, A1 and P1, that's the positive. And then you have the other examples um, in the same batch where you say, okay, the others are the, the negative. Um, and then you, you say, okay, this A1, P1 should be close and the others should be, should be distant. So this explains why with a larger batch size, um, that the quality is improving because you get more of these negatives in the batch. But however, if you add like random negatives to it, it's kind of like an easy learning task compared to like a multiple choice test in, 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 in school. If the answer, other answer options are all random, it's like really easy. So if you ask like how many people live in Berlin, I do not really test the person if they know like how many people live in Berlin. And it's like really easy for you to differentiate which of these three options is the correct one. So here it makes sense to have like these hard negatives where you say, okay, I sneak into like one, two, or how many you want to have of these hard negatives. And yeah, there are different ways how you can get them. I, I talk on this, um, if you go on my website, like great detail. Um, typically what you do is like you search for it, like how many people live in London with some search engine and you look what is the search engine retrieving. And then you try to filter out like the bad examples so that you come up with like some good triplet. Um, okay, so there's a question. Um, why do you use knowledge distillation? Is it to reduce the size of the model? Is it latency or issue of accuracy? So knowledge distillation here is, is in the multilingual setting. So mm -hmm. in English, we have a lot of training data available. So it's really easy to get um, to get like billions of training examples. But for other languages, it's not available. So here the idea is you start with the English model, which is like widely available. And then you teach the model to learn also to represent other languages as well by aligning everything to the English vector space. So it's not really to make it smaller or to, to improve the accuracy, just to extend the capability and to get like a student model that's not only understands English, but like all the languages you train for. There's a question for large batch sizes. Uh, is there data parallelism implemented in Esper for multi GPU training? Um, so yeah, large batch sizes, here you wanna scale the, the batch size to, to like larger, like 4K, 8K examples. Mm -hmm. and, and at some point you run out of like GPU memory. So you have to, to scale to like multiple GPUs. <clears throat> But the challenge, so, so right now it's not implemented in SBIRT, um, is that the GPUs need to communicate. So in traditional PyTorch training, multi-GPU training, you distribute your data and then every uh, node, every GPU <coughs> trains the, 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 the loss and computes the gradient. And then you do like an average on these. But here, what you need to do is like you compute the embedding so, so you split the embeddings, you compute the embeddings individually on the GPUs, and then you have, need to have like an all gate operation that shares all the embeddings across all GPUs. Um, and, and then only then you can, are able to compute the loss and that's much harder to implement. Um, so, so it's sadly not implemented there. So there's a question, if I do not have negatives and only positives, um, how do I synthesize hard negatives from the data set? So, so, so yeah, you do typically first step, you take this, how many people live in Berlin, you have a collection, let's say of 1 million documents, you use some search engine, lexical search, semantic search to find like the nearest neighbor for this. 
and then you need to clean it. So, so you need to really ensure that this is not like another positive, but like really ne negative. There's a question, how do you handle text with words in more than one language, such as translation need to English or adios, old friend? Um, again, the, the model does not care, it doesn't run any language identification. So it does not care what your data looks like. It doesn't need to know, is it English, is it German, is it French? Um, it just learns like these vector representations. So it learns um, when I ask like, who is the president that who is the president and Joe Biden is the current US president needs to be close in the vector space. And then based on the training data, if you have like these mixed languages. So for example, in India, in Indian languages, you have it often that you people mix languages, then they just recognize and say, okay, yeah, ignore the language. Just put this question and this answer close together. There's a question, how would you deal with inference um, with the inference of one language into another in your training data? For example, in Dutch, higher number of English expressions, uh, words, titles, synonyms, loan words are used. How do you make sure that data for this doesn't skew towards an over-representation of English? Um, so yeah, that, that's again like this, this language bias. Um, that you so so it's not like only and if, if you put like two languages you you see okay English and English is like closer together but also if you put like more languages then probably like Dutch and English is closer than Dutch and and Chinese because people put mix more English and Dutch words together than uh, Dutch and Chinese or Russian or or Arabic words together so it kind of learns how do people communicate and what type of answers they want to have? So, so it's taking up the bias in terms of like what in your training data. Um, if you don't want this, so, so if you really want to have a model without a language bias, that's much harder to, to create um, where you specifically need to align and say, okay, train it in such a way that, that the language does not give you like a hint on the answer. Uh, where you say, okay, I take like a Dutch question and here a Chinese answer is the correct answer. In the world, you seldom find it that someone asks like a question in Dutch and then someone responds in like Chinese. So you often use like machine translation to artificially create such data sets. There's a question, how do you select the vocabulary size for multilingual tokenizer? <clears throat> so tokenization, in a multilingual setting, this is an interesting uh, scientific question. Um, totally, you want to increase the, the size of the vocabulary. We're using like 500,000 tokens. Um, most recent work is using like a million tokens so that all the languages are well represented. And totally, I'm, I'm more of a fan of like larger vocabulary size. Uh, so, so I can highly recommend also for English to increase the vocabulary size. Where I think BERT was like 38 tokens is like way too small. So yeah, there's a question, what's the future of sentence transformers? Um, yeah, sadly, I'm lacking time to, to really maintain the open source repository. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's a challenge if when you go from academia into industry, uh, that after like a full day of work in an industry, it's like really hard to put in like the effort and time to maintain it. Question, how do you set up training data sets for multilingual model? Did you guys provide data or randomly provide data pairs to the model? Um, so yeah, setup is, is an interesting challenge. Um, Many out of the box models, um, box systems, tutorials, if you follow like Hugging Face Transformers, they, they load like every training pair into memory. And this works nice if you have like a thousand or a million training pairs. But if you have like a billion or more training pairs, it's not really doable to load like terabytes of training data in memory and then do like the shuffling in memory. So you need to find like smarter ways um, how to load the data. 
also you find, need to find like smarter ways how to balance. So some data sets are extremely large, have like, I don't know, 100 million of triplets, others are smaller, have maybe 10,000 of triplets. You need to balance across languages. So for English, you have a lot of data. For low resource language, you have little data. And yeah, a lot of yeah, really carefully testing individual data sets. Also, we're not having like one training data sets, but we split it into like, I don't know, like 500 files. Then you carefully test every of these 500 subsets to, to find like bad apples. So, so which data sets uh, to do have like low quality so that you can remove them. And then you you read a lot from disk and say, okay, you you predefine the the weights for all these data sets. But yeah, really most time is not really spent on like setting up the training pipeline, but like handling the data, how to read it, how to load it, how to balance it across data sets, across tasks, across languages. There's a question, what do you mean with multi-field? So nice thing about lexical search <clears throat> and elastic search is the possibility of like multiple fields. For example, in e-commerce, you have um, the product title and then the product is available in different uh, colors and in, in different sizes. And then you have like in, in JSON, like these different fields where you say, this is the title. Here are like different colors, green, red, yellow, and sizes, small, medium, large. And then with Elasticsearch, lexical search, it's really easy to say, um, find like a blue jeans uh, size medium. And then it matches the jeans to the title, the color, the blue to the color, and the medium to the size. So, so this works really nice. But in semantic search, if you put the text and say, okay, I have jeans, it's available in blue, red, and yellow, and sizes small, medium, large, you get terrible results. Um, so, so it doesn't work at all if you do this. And you have to do a lot of hacking to, to get it well with current approaches, but we're working on it to make semantic search also available for like these multi-field approaches. Question, how can you contact me? So there's a website called niels-rimers.de or you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and yeah, stay in contact there. Um, so there's a question, how to deal with homographs across languages in the model, e.g. hard in English, German, or Dutch, and is champion English or French? So yeah, th this is like uh, really a problem if you have these language identification step. So, so here you need to know um, if champion or bank or the word, yeah, uh, heart, what's the language? Is, is, is it like English and do you have to put it into like the English collection? Is it French and you have to put it into the French collection, which make it really terrible. But again, the, the model doesn't care about, again, um, the embedding model doesn't care about the language, so it's not necessary to know is, is champion English or French. Mm -hmm. um, it will just represent the, the, the representation. And then based on the training data, it will either lean towards like the, the English meaning of champion or the French meaning of champion um, if they're like different meanings. So, so let's say you have like the same word, but there are like different meanings in different languages. For example, the, the English word die um, and the German word D, it's spelled the same, but in German it's an article. So here it will just take the bias from the um, from the training data. So it, if it sees this in a more in a context of English, it will take the, the English meaning. And that's again like the challenge was uh, how do you weight the different languages? Um, so so for English, you have a lot more meaning or a lot more training examples, but you wants to avoid that everything needs towards the English examples. Let's let uh, Scott ask a question live. Uh, you can uh, go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you. Thank you for the talk. And, and I wanted to chime in because um, the question before this last one kind of ties to, or your answer tied to, to what I was wondering, which is you were saying that, you know, in some cases, other kinds of search besides semantic, pure semantic search can be useful and helpful, but then, um, I was just wondering if you, you know, how you think about 
trying to have some sort of step in your pipeline where it's trying to determine the intent of the user and so um, and the situation and then therefore kind of maybe route it to either semantic search or keyword search or sort of the more elastic style? Yeah, that's that's good good question. Um, so so that's also very common in like many of these more advanced setups. So often you set up both. So you set up lexical search and you set up semantic search. And then either people query uh, both at the same time. And then you merge kind of like the results at the end. Or you do it before that you say, okay, what's the intent? Um, if you have like in search, it can be like some navigational query, like, okay, I know this is the document. It has like this title. I want to find it. And you're just reading it to like lexical search. Or when you put in like a question, what's the capital of the United States in 1700? Where you say, okay, that works well for semantic search. So you're rooting it for semantic search. <laughs> Especially intent classification is interesting because um, different costs for the two different systems where you say semantic search is, is more expensive because you have these um, transformer model on a GPU and so, so it produces a lot higher cost than lexical search. So there are like some people try to, to say, okay, I try to answer with lexical search as much as possible and then fall back to a semantic search only to like the more expensive and complex queries. But still user intent is like really hard to, to get it right. Like really know, okay, is it like really a keyword search was a semantic search? So, so that's tough. Thank you. What? Go ahead with your next question, Nils, then I'll uh, enable someone else. Go ahead with the next one. Um, do you use any behavior testing on the model using a checklist? Um, so luckily for search, um, the, they're like different data sets and it's easier to get like objective matrices um, where you say, okay, that this is like the questions people ask, people are interested in, and these are like the relevant answers. That's what we primarily use for or the models say, okay, these are like the top 10 results and we've shown a lot of queries to humans and ask, okay, what are like the perfect answers to it? And then we can compare it. But yeah, for the generative models, a lot harder. And there also includes like a lot more testing. Is it in terms of like biases, um, hate speech generation and so on. All right, um, let me see if we want to do this. Uh, David, do you want to ask your question now? You should be able to speak. No. All right. Well, Nils, why don't you go on to the next uh, question from uh, uh, Patrick? Right. Yeah. So there's a question on these triplets. Um, so, so, so yeah, these these triplets they they play an extremely critical role. Um, on the one side. So, so this black line is without triplets, the red line is with the triplets, you get like massive boost in quality with the triplets. But if you screw it up and get like have many bad examples like this one where the negative is not really a negative, it extremely confuses the model and the performance is terrible bad. So we spend a lot of time on these triplets. Um, some heuristics is just you're, you're checking the length. So I don't know, you have a question, like for example, from web data, you you draw like how many people live in London and then the positive is yes, where you know, okay, just from the length, it doesn't appear to, to make that much sense. Um, so so there are like some FAQ website, data sets from websites where you have questions like, um, does your hotel allow dogs? And then the answer is like, yes, where we say, okay, it's, it's not the most informative in a search setting to retrieve for the question, do, does your hotel allow dogs? To answer was yes. So, so there are some heuristics on the length. Like is the positive sufficiently long and longer than the question and is both not too long? And then using some of like larger models that go in and, and tries to identify like bad triplets. So, so it looks at like these bad, at these triplets where it knows, okay, this is a good triplet, this is a bad triplet. And then say, um, 
filter out and say, okay, these are most likely the, the bad triplets. All right, David, do you want to go ahead with your question? And you can go on camera if you wish. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you, Niels, for the presentation. Um, I am I'm really uh, I'm here in this NLP. I am currently a, a research data analyst at NYU and a master in data science student. I'm, I'm, I'm researching now the um, pathological image analysis, uh, basically to uh, computer-assisted diagnose using the images of the tissue to find if that tissue is diseased. But one of the biggest problems we have in this field is that there is a very small quantity of data about this because of the uh, necessity of, of qualified people to label the, the images. But not only that is a problem, it's that the labels, the data that is labeled, it's difficult to extract those labels since uh, most of them, it's a narrative label. It's a, it's a text that they, mm -hmm. they write on uh, describing what the pathologists write, describing what they see in the images. And another problem is that most of the research, research it's geographic, geographically concentrated due to the, to the fact that it's difficult to uh, analyze a label made by a doctor in China or in Korea from people here. So. Do you think, uh, watching this, uh, your presentation, do you think this model could be applied to overcome these types of problems that we are facing? Yes, so the, the, these embedding approaches are kind of really also widely used to, in terms of data augmentation and, and data annotation. Um, so, so what you can do is like you, you start, represent your, your data like, um, you can either do it on like the images or the descriptions. Let's say you, you take this as an image and then you annotate it as class A. And then you show like other images which are also similar. So, so which show like similar patterns in the vector space. And then likely these are also like class A. And then for annotators, it's easy to say, okay, I just described here, this image has like class A to quickly build, like say, okay, this is class A, this is also class A, say, I like check, 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 make the, the data annotation faster. And people, if you say it, it's like on a on a description level, the, the data can also try to match like descriptions where you project like two descriptions to the vector space and say, okay, in the vector space, you look like for the close pairs. So these two are like two descriptions which are really close. So likely it's the same. And also for like data cleaning, where you you say, okay, um, maybe people misclassified things, and then you can also look in the vector space and say, okay, everything is blue, but this one is like classified as orange. So you can have a look, and often it's like, yeah, people misclicked, and it should also be blue. All right, back to the Q&A. You have a question from Kat Chanel of which vector DB you use. Yeah, yeah, we're working together with different vector databases. So I'm more focusing on creating these, these models and have good relationships with like all of them, VV8, Pineco, Movis, West Bay AI, uh, and so on and so on. So uh, can't, can't really, it really depends on the use case what you want. If you want to have a managed solution, self-hosted solution, um, is it a small scale setup or like a large enterprise setup? And then based on this, different solutions are the best one. There's not like one vector database I can recommend, say, okay, this, this is the best one. Um, so there's a question about adding numerical features during retrieval. Um, so yeah, so, so if you want to add like numerical features like recency popularity of an item, it's, it's hard to do this in embeddings because it's not really, if, if you take like recency, um, of, of a document, this is changing. Like if you, they like take like as a metric, I don't know, days since it was published, it would change every day. So you would need to rebuild your vector database every day. And instead what you do it, you put it into like a second model 
where you retrieve based on like the text and then you add these information popularity recency page rank whatever and then you input it to like a model classical this is known as learning to rank where you have like xgboost or lambda mart um, or like also neural networks where you put it as an input to a neural network to, to give out the final results Then how to get domain specific embeddings? Um, is the embedding model fine-tunable? Um, so right now the, the Cohere embedding model, it's not yet fine-tunable. So we're currently working on this um, to, to adapt it to domain. It's kind of like a challenge to, to adapt it to domains because in many domains you're lacking like the necessary training pairs. So in not that many cases people have like these training pairs where they say yeah we have like a billion question and answers in our i don't know clinical context they just say sorry we just have like a million notes clinical notes and so so big question is like how do you create these positive pairs and here what we're using is like what works well is, is the generate model so you take the clinical notes and then you ask or generate model, hey, give, give some, some questions people could ask about this document. And then you take these pairs and you train it. And so we're currently working on to make it production ready. Um, but in general, because the, the, our models has seen like over a billion training pairs, training triplets, it has seen a lot of domains. So it's, it's kind of really say, really hard to find like domains uh, that are like out of domain and where you would expect like a really big, big improvement. So it's also for us a bit to actually evaluate because like all evaluation data sets, um, these are domains which are well covered already in the training data. So the model is performing really well in like, I don't know, legal case or programming or tech or online gaming. So, so we're really looking for like these niche cases, internal cases, to get like evaluation data there to see how well is the domain adaptation really working. Very good. I guess uh, Hamad Khan must be your colleague at Cohere. All right, uh, we, we've had, uh, I think over 20 minutes of questions, which is a great sign. Uh, so it's really interesting talk. Thank you, Nils. Uh, I'm going to, uh, yeah, we're gonna post the video within a few hours. It should be at nlpxing.com. And I will uh, just uh, reshare the slide here that we have a next program that's already scheduled for April 19th. And that if you're interested in giving a presentation, just drop me a note uh, by email is good, or you can message me on the LinkedIn platform, uh, not the LinkedIn platform, you can message me on the meetup platform. Uh, so uh, thanks everyone for attending. You can look for the video and thanks very much Nils for speaking and see you all Great. next time. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.